Well, good evening and welcome to another episode of Slantcast, the official podcast of Slant Books. My name is Gregory Wolf and I am Slant's publisher and editor. We're glad you're here. Tonight, we're looking forward to our book launch for Twin A, a memoir with author Amit Majmadar. Though we've known each other for many years via email and the printed page, this is our first meeting virtual face to virtual face. At least we're halfway there. But before I turn the screen over to Amit, a brief word about Slant Books. Recently, I was asked by an editor at the Writer's Chronicle to explain what Slant's slant is, so to speak. And since my answer wasn't half bad, I'll pass it along here. On our blog recently, the poet Rick Chess wrote, I read to be read, to be known what's present in me and what's lacking. I found this echoed in a recent brilliant essay by Garth Greenwell, who believes we are suffering under a hyper-moralistic culture, one that in the pursuit of moral and political righteousness is undermining the very essence of art, which is to probe mystery, ambiguity, and paradox. Greenwell says, the task of art isn't to judge, but to know, to observe, to carry out research into the human. And that, he concludes, is precisely its moral function. We hope that slant is a haven for those who believe in that perennial task of literature, who abhor the idea of what I've called reading for self-congratulation, and who prefer their books to be confusing, unsettling, arresting, and ultimately transformative. I love that phrase, carrying out research into the human. That's pretty close to a tagline or motto for slant. If you'd like to learn more about the vision behind the press, we invite you to visit our website, slantbooks.org. Tonight, we are here for another exciting online book launch event. But before I introduce our reader, I'd just like to remind you that if you have questions for Amit, please feel free to type them in the chat. I will then pass them along. Time permitting, I will try to share as many of those as possible. I will also post a link to SLAMP's webpage for Twin A, where you will find several options for purchasing a copy of the book. And now, a few words of introduction of our featured author this evening. Actually, I just misspoke. There is no way to introduce Amit's biography in just a few words. <laughs> it's not possible. But I promise to speak fast and with the awe and gratitude I feel for his many achievements. Amit Majmadar is a poet, novelist, essayist, translator, and had the distinction of being the inaugural Poet Laureate of Ohio. He works as a diagnostic and nuclear radiologist and lives in Westerville, Ohio, with his wife and three children. We'll be hearing about them soon. Majmadar's poetry collections include Zero Degrees, Zero Degrees, shortlisted for the Norma Faber First Book Award, and Heaven and Earth, which won the Donald Justice Prize. These volumes were followed by Dothead and What He Did in Solitary, both published by Knopf. His poems have won the Pushcart Prize and have appeared in the Norton Introduction to Literature, The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, The Kenyan Review, The New York Review of Books, and numerous Best American Poetry anthologies, as well as journals and magazines across the United States, UK, India, and Australia. Majmadar's essays have appeared in the Best American Essays 2018, The New York Times, and The Times of India and he is contributing editor at Marginalia at the Los Angeles Review of Books. His recent collection of essays, focusing on Indian religious philosophy, history, and mythology, Black Avatar, and other essays, came out from Acre Books earlier this year. Majmadar's work as a novelist include works of historical fiction, realism, and magical realism, not to mention books for young adults. These include Partitions, the Map and the Scissors, Heroes, the Color of Dust, Soar, and the Abundance. 
Majmadar's work in Hindu mythology includes a polyphonic Ramayana telling, Sityana, the Maharabhata trilogy, and a YA novel, The Later Adventures of Hanuman. His work as a translator includes God Song, a verse translation of the Bhagavad Gita with commentary. It is a great honor and delight to ask Amit to read from Twin A. Amit, over to you. Thank you, first of all, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and uh, I wanted, I, and thank you all to all the well-wishers who have come out uh, virtually to be a part of this. Um, this is a very special book for me, um, Twin A, for obvious reasons, um, because it's more personal than any of the other things I've written. If I'm writing about historical fiction or mythology or this or that. It's kind of, you know, based on things I've read, but this is based on things I've experienced. So it kind of hits different. And uh, I really owe a, a really uh, huge debt of gratitude to Mr. Gregory Wolf, the, the publisher of Slant Books, for taking a risk on a very unorthodox book like this that doesn't necessarily fit into any one category, because as you'll hear, it has elements of uh, memoir, it has elements, it has poems in it, it has fables in it, it has philosophical digressions in it. Um, and so it's a kind of a mix of everything. And that's not necessarily the way books are typically written or structured. Um, he and I go way back, uh, back in the day, um, before email and uh, uh, submittable and all the electronic stuff in the early 2000s, I had no books to my name, no publications to my name. And we would send out poems with a self-addressed stamped envelope, okay? And I saw Image Journal and uh, I saw what was in it and I knew that they had a feel for the numinous. And when I say they, I was actually, you know, you think, oh, they have a sense for the numinous, but really it was this individual specifically who was the editor and publisher of that, of that journal. And so um, basically, you know, I, I sensed that this was the, you know, potential audience for what I was doing with the language. And I wasn't wrong. And he was probably one of the first editors uh, and to accept my work, period. And I was going through some old papers very recently, and I found that first original, uh, you know, hand-signed acceptance letter from Image from 2004 or 2006 or something. And I thought, what? who, who could imagine that years later, he would have a publishing company and this would be one of the books, one of my most cherished books that he would he would end, it would go on to publish. And <clears throat> so what I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read just a few passages from it that give you a feel for the different types of writing that are in the in the book. And the first thing I'm going to read is just the first chapter, which is called You Are Born. And that first chapter is probably the right thing to read because it uh, it yes, contains um, a little bit of, of everything. It contains narrative, it contains some uh, poetry, and it contains some reflective um, uh, you know passages. So uh, so this is the very big, this is the very start of the book, and uh, and it's in the first chapter called "You Are Born." You are born. Light is new. It sprays down, white and caustic, right into your eyes. The pressure on all sides, which you have felt your whole life, which grew firmer and firmer as your body swelled and stretched the walls of your mother, that pressure has dropped away all at once. Imagine a passenger in a plane, asleep under a blanket, with a sleeping mask on, his ears accustomed to the engine roar, the same way yours were to the roar of blood in the womb. Now the cabin rips open, the sleeping mask and blanket fly off, the passenger awakens from dreamless sleep to find himself falling through a blaze of sunlight. That's what this is like for you. Only from your perspective, you're falling in every direction at once. No wonder you're screaming. Your sense of gravity was always vague because you have never not been submerged. Your down and up used to shift, subtly or drastically, 
depending on whether your mother walked or sat at a certain angle with her legs crossed or laid on her side or on her back. Now you have one fixed up and one fixed down. Hands hold you and pass you about, doctor to resident to nurse, but you don't know they are hands. Hands are new, they are thin, hard, slick, pokey. You are too bewildered to process much about hands, much less the suction bulbs stabbing your nose, much less the universe, other than that it is foreign and aggressive, one long sequence of invasions and violations. The water you used to swallow and breathe is gone, replaced with something far less substantial. Air is new, it has no heft. You never had anything but silence inside you. Sound fills your head now, and the harder you cry, the louder it gets. It is coming from a spot very close to your ears, only on the inside, closer than close. Your voice, too, is new. You're on a cloth now under a hot lamp. Cloth is new and startlingly coarse. Your back has never felt anything but membrane, smooth muscle, flowing water, and creme fraiche vernix. The hot lamp feels like something you know, but the heat is all in one place and not all around you as it used to be. This is distance. This is separation. Your mouth has never been empty before. Your hands seek out your face, the only things familiar from the womb. This is the moment. With all the inspections complete, 10 fingers, 10 toes, pinking up nicely, that you're supposed to be handed back to your mother. She would make a hushing sound, instinctively mimicking the womb's blood rush. The, the pressure of the swaddling and her steady hold on you would stop your free fall into the universe outside you. But that isn't what is happening because you aren't pinking up nicely. Your body is strangely gray all over. You are being wheeled into a crowd of waiting hands, which descend from above and spider over you. Thin, slippery tubes with needle fangs snake up from the corners of the bassinet and sting you in the crook of your elbow, the crease of your groin. They begin to suck your blood. Light, breath, voice, distance, and now pain, sooner than expected, your education is complete. Welcome to the world, son. You get inspected by people in different uniforms. Long white coat, short white coat, bright green surgical scrubs, bright green surgical scrubs with a white coat over them, blue nursing scrubs. You don't see them very clearly. You have the stunned blind eyes of a just-born kitten glassed with ointment. Dark iris and darker pupil seem to fill the thin slit between your eyelids. You blink at these people, slowly, in a way that makes it seem you are studying them back. What are they looking for? Right now, your doctors hunt your body for any problems that the ultrasound studies performed before your birth could not have picked up. The whole team has been briefed about the big problem with your heart. It's that problem which has made them rush you straight from your mother's body into the intensive care unit. In all of these faces, scholarly excitement overrides, for the moment, compassion. You are a real, live, fascinating case. And the last thing you want to be in medicine is a fascinating case. The greater the rarity, the greater the fascination. And the greater the fascination, the greater your suffering. These strangers, these strangers are searching for what's sometimes called a, quote, constellation of findings. In that implicit metaphor, every birth defect is a star. And together, these disasters form the image of an archer, a bear, a scorpion. The doctors and doctors in training scan your body like a night sky. They don't 
want you to have any of these other signs like micrognathia, small jaw, or hypospadias, a urethra splayed open in a pink wet fissure along the underside of the penis. But they do want to find the signs if they are there. This wish to see in real life the mythical babies of textbook photographs will lead to conjectural, almost wishful documentation. So the notes on that first day claim your jaw is too small and the opening of your, ureth of your urethra stretches too far. They have searched you so hard, they end up finding what isn't there. A list of associated defects memorized off a flashcard when cramming for an exam years before gets superimposed onto you. In a few days, these other minor diagnoses will magically evaporate, but the big one will remain stubbornly, catastrophically at the heart of you. Over and over, more, than, more often than any of the others, a face pops into your field of view. Cheeks a little scruffy, dark eyes sunken behind thin-rimmed glasses, poofy blue surgical cap. This stranger is wearing a full-body jumpsuit that seems made of paper and light blue booties over his sneakers, though you can't see those right now. Occasionally, he puts a glowing rectangle to his ear and chatters into it. At other times, he just blinks at your blink or lays his Purell smelling finger on your palm to feel your fingers close around it. You recognize the voice as one you have been hearing in the womb, though then it came through amniotic fluid, muffled. Now it comes through sharp and raw, even though it's a whisper, two syllables as he points at his chest, de and d, de and D. I know exactly what your alternate destiny looks like without these wires and beeping computer monitors. Every so often over the next few days, I leave the intensive care unit for a different wing of the hospital. I pass the Einstein Brothers bagel kiosk in the glass roofed two bright foyer, the gift shop with the angel trinkets, the piano no one ever plays. I arrive at another bassinet where a second newborn, identical to you, lies sated, sleeping. Your mother lies near this other you, recovering from her cesarean section and periodically trying to nurse. It's as if the two wings of this hospital exist in parallel universes, one universe benevolent, the other abandoned to chance. I shuttle between the two yous, wary of shortchanging the you I am not with two newborns in iambic alternation, one unstressed, the other stressed. That room is quiet except for a classical raga in the background, the lyrics Sanskrit and sacred, the volume kept low. The iPod nested in a speaker glows. That far away unattainable room is full of family members. It pulses with daylight from the swept aside curtains. You should be here too. You are not here. I am writing this to tell you, among other things, why. Dear Shiv, I started this out as a letter. I wanted to outline what went on in the first years of your life. I expected to get down a couple of pages I could put in an envelope in the safe, along with your social security card and passport. When you got old enough to ask detailed questions, I figured. I could take it out and let you read it. A letter from me now to the future you. Like the events it describes, the writing escaped my control. Hook up a circuit in parallel and the voltage equal, equal, is a single miraculous energy that cannot be created or destroyed. Only twinned, twinned as life as a life is through a pair of umbilical cords, your mother powerful enough to charge the sun, your mother a hemoelectric power plant, illuminating twin cities, illuminating my study lamps, two light bulbs just above my head, equal, equal, floating there like two ideas for telling the same story, one in prose, one in verse, 
twin A, twin B, circuits in parallel, cries from the heart, born from a shock. I imagine you reading this years from now when you were a man, or maybe still a teenager, whatever age you are when you stop your life's forward motion to inspect and marvel at the obstacle course it has been. I know you will want details and explanations and you deserve them. Obviously, we plan to be there to tell you in person, but there is no guarantee of that. Even ignoring worst case scenarios, I worry about the workings of memory. My own, at the very least. I confess I'm already losing things. Anecdotes, bit parts, and peripheral characters. How things played out. These elements are already going the way they always do. The experience has been reduced to freeze frames and elisions, the record of it scratched and skipping. 10 years from now, how much of my memory will still be readable if I don't write this down now? Fortunately, your mother has a prodigious memory for every last thing. In her memory, the crisis years are clearly ordered, important details and conversations readily called up. So I've written a lot of this relying on conversations with her, and she is vetting these pages as I go, making sure I don't leave out anything important. I came across a study as I was writing this down that showed women possess a superior declarative memory compared to men. That means they are better at tasks like, quote, the retrieval of long-term memories of specific events and facts, and thus better at remembering family history. Comparing your mother and myself, this is absolutely true. Dear Shiv is how I began this when I intended to jot down some things that weren't in the medical record. My letter grew and grew into what you're reading now, with stories and poems and bits of medicine and anatomy, and some places where I'm just thinking things through with you. Not that I claim some great wisdom, some neat takeaway that will make what happened make perfect sense. All I can do is get down the facts of what happened. You live the wisdom. I observe and take notes. Suffer, my boy, no men of wisdom. You are 20 times a swami by surviving. Let the gurus, cross-legged, sit at the feet of Swami Shiv. You teach them. Courage comes from core, the heart, and pulse means seed and feeds the rock dove's hunger every April. Blood is sang, and sanguine spirits sing when no one else is singing. Heartened by the hush, no tabla, save your pulse. In a sense, though, this is still a letter. Think of this book, with all its organs and vessels and bones and nerves, with its fables and explanations and anecdotes and poems, as one long fan letter from your dad, sent through time. So that's the first chapter. And um, as I mentioned in there, there's a whole bunch of you know different fables, anecdotes, and uh, accounts of you know what happened. And um, one of the things that I'm going to read is a very short fable. It's the first fable that I wrote as a part of this book or with this book in mind. In retrospect, I realized that it may not even directly relate to the book, but it's it's in there because it was definitely written with this book in mind or only for this book. And the reason I know that is because of uh, the fact that it's called Dewdrop and Rosebush. And I know for a fact that out of all those books that we were talking about and all the poems that I've written over the years, I've never used the word dewdrop and I've never used the word rosebush because I consider those to be like, you know, not sophisticated literary words. But this was something, this is a very short little fable that I have in, embedded in this, in this book. And it's because I was writing to a child that I felt uh, liberated to use what I would in other contexts consider like trite words or trite imagery. And uh, and so I, I'll let you, I'll let you judge whether it's like that or not. But this is um, this is the I think this is the first uh, fable in the course of the book. It's called Dewdrop and Rosebush. Once upon a time, Dewdrop was sad. I am not a raindrop. 
I didn't fall from heaven. I'm not a teardrop. No one cried me. Every morning, I am born on this rose, sometimes on a leaf, sometimes on a petal, sometimes on a thorn, sometimes high up the stem and sometimes low. But by midday, I always burn away. By dawn, I do return, but not to stay. Rosebush laughed. Do you drop only part of you burns away? The other part of you, I drink into myself. You water my flowering and grow my fragrance. These are as much yours as they are mine. On petal, leaf, or thorn, I wear you as a jewel. You come back in the morning because you are needed here. You leave at midday because the sky loves you. Dewdrop rejoiced to learn this about herself. Now she welcomed the sunlight, brighter and brighter, smaller and smaller, until she was all gone. No, not gone. She knew better now. She was one with the rose bush and one with the heavens. Part of her answered the thirst of the roses. Part of her answered the call of the clouds. As midday approached, she sang to Rosebush, I would have rejoiced had I gotten to stay, but it's still a joy to depart and a joy to return the next day, a joy to be born and a joy to burn away, a joy to be here and a joy to go there. May I fold into fragrance and join the air. I guess that kind of has to do with like reincarnation, I guess, in a sense. Um, and uh, and so now to give you uh, a feel for uh, the more kind of philosophical aspect of uh, of the book, this is one of the later or 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 uh, you know the the uh, concluding chapters of the book, and um, uh, basically. Um, this this is this is uh it's it's kind of self-explanatory um it just talks about um the the entire kind of situation of what it what it you know how can you explain uh the fact that um of two twins uh one twin would be would be born with a uh potentially fatal, but uh, treatable, but fatal, potentially fatal um, congenital heart defect. And then um, there's, there's a, there's a question of fairness of, of uh, an unfairness, a question of how the universe could decide that, or God could decide that, or, or how such things are decided in fate or chance or this or that, and whether there's any explanation that can that can reconcile the mind and the heart to to such an outcome or such a situation, um, and that holds true not just in this one situation, but it holds true that that question holds true of of misfortune and suffering writ large in the universe itself um, for all people and all times and. And and so how do you how do you reconcile yourself to that? Is there a way to reconcile yourself to that? And if there isn't, how do you move forward? And this is this chapter is the whole book is kind of a, a meditation on that. And this chapter deals with it a little bit in in more of a direct philosophical way. And so this is also a different kind of this is also one of the kinds of writing that is in Twin A. And the chapter is called Tools. All of this happened. The question is why. You can gnaw that old bone until you are an old man and your stomach won't feel any fuller. A good rule is, if it's a question you can't answer until you're dead, don't bother speculating, just be patient. Many people follow that rule happily. 
You can see them in the restaurant at the height of a pandemic, throwing burgers and beers down the chute with the game playing on three screens all around. Many people read a pat answer in a book and consider the matter settled. In the year 2007, in Cleveland, Ohio, a fetus's heart and lungs never formed a connection. Why? Because God willed it. Why? Because of karma. Why? Because the universe is masterless, accidental, and our individual fates are just post-it notes scribbled on and folded and shaken in a hat. On most days, I don't believe in a God who micromanages things, but on bad days, I pray like I do. A good outcome means I give him credit. A bad outcome means I must have deserved it. The idea I believed most days with my conscious mind was karma. Just keep it out of the NICU, and the idea is perfect. Actions over thousands of past births affect the weather patterns of, fa of fate in this one. Sins are acts of cruelty hundreds of years ago in other bodies are the butterflies wing beats that following from chaos theory result in a hurricane of suffering today. Some act of kindness or generosity by the same token transfers to this life's account, granting someone kind and prosperous parents or a transfiguring marriage. I loved karma because it was up to me to endure the upshot of my past deeds and shape my future by good works in this one. How empowering that idea seemed. Suffering was symmetry. I controlled my future lives. Now walk that idea away from Twin B's peaceful bassinet. Take it on the elevators, down the, to the first floor, across the hospital, past the gift shop, up in another elevator now to Twin A, shrieking inside a noisy tangle of wires and tubes. Like a starving foundling snaked about with vines, karma seems callous. Did it matter what Twin A might have done in some past life? He was here now, in this body, enduring this pain. His suffering shamed divine will and karmic justice alike. So chance then. India named the four yugas after throws of the dice. The current yuga is the Kali Yuga, named for what gamblers call the snake eye, the single dot, the losing throw. The physician in me knows why you were born with your condition. Genetics has nothing to do with it, since your brother was normal. The defect, the defect, like the Kawasaki syndrome that piled onto it, occurred sporadically. That is, sometimes it just happens. No larger idea justifies the unfairness. Science's answer to you is just as callous as predestinations or karmas. Tough luck, kid. These three ways of looking at it, that number again, I have over the years tried on and slipped off again, three worldviews like hats in a mirror. And this may well be as it should be. Believe in chance when you feel resentment and the resentment goes away because how is a roll of the dice personal? Believe in karma when you feel powerless before your own suffering or cold to someone else's because your every action is taken note of and you owe it to your future self to do good to those around you, to rack up kindnesses here and now, to support the family and focus on your work and survive and survive. Be stubborn, make suffering snap its stick across your back and toss it aside in frustration. Grab your boyhood by the handlebars and pedal hard, buckle yourself into your future and drive. Believe in karma and restore your future to your control. When we wheel you into the cath suite or the OR and hand you over to the nurse anesthetist in blue scrubs and a face mask and your panic shimmers under the sedative, what use is a belief in chance or karma? Believe in the time of crisis, in your fear or despair, that you have a celestial ally. Speak your prayer in whatever language feels right feels direct and intimate and understood, musical Sanskrit or mother tongue English, because a word directed God word sends an impulse, like a rifle bucking against the shoulder back into the speaker. The mind absorbs that equal and opposite force and gains strength from it. The power you attribute to God becomes yours. 
I'm going to uh, hold off on reading the rest of that passage because I realize that uh, one very, very important person is in the audience right now, um, and that is um, Shiv's cardiologist, who is um, Dr. Zaka, someone who's so important to our family. Um, and uh, I just feel like I, I want to read this chapter that I, I and I, I, by the way, you know, I have to say that I, I, I've not written, I've written a whole chapter, more than a whole chapter about him, but really, uh, Dr. Zaka, I got to say that um, there's no way that I can, we can, our family can repay you. And also, uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's, you, you're just, I mean, as you'll see in this chapter, I, I, I do feel like we have some sort of mystical connection, but um when, when, you know, this is, this, this is um, how we first met Dr. Zaka and um, I'd actually, and anyway, I'll just, I'll do, this is, this part is the um, kind of more of the narrative uh, part of the book where I'm talking about um, the people and all of the people who worked together to um, make things have a, a positive outcome and have the experience be livable and bearable for everyone. And, um, and Dr. Z is the, you know, Dr. Zaka was, was central to that. Um, and so this is, this is the chapter uh, about that. Your mother's recovery after the cesarean section had not been easy. And for the first few days of your life, she saw you only rarely, pushed to your floor in a wheelchair once or twice a day. After the surgery, you were still in no state to breastfeed, but she came to hold you and give you pumped breast milk from a plastic bottle with a nipple. One day, after the nurse helped transfer you to her lap, I left for the apartment to wash up, and she was alone in your room. After she had sung to you and rocked you a little, she turned to find someone sitting in the rocking chair next to her. She had not noticed this man enter the room or sit down. He was rocking thoughtfully, hands clasped in his lap, with the hint of a grandfatherly smile on his lips. The man wasn't wearing a white coat. For a moment, he seemed to be testing out the rocker, and then he started chatting with her about the names of her twins. What did Shiv mean? What did Savya mean? And how was she feeling? How wonderful that the hospital sends around volunteers like this, she thought. She hadn't known how much she liked having someone take an interest in you for your own sake. You weren't just a patient. You were also a newborn boy who had received a name you would keep for the rest of your life. It felt good to be reminded of that. Presently, a nurse entered and asked this kindly gentleman a question about prostaglandin dosage. He answered it with an exact number, still rocking. Your mother, astonished, saw for the first time the name tag clipped to his breast pocket, Dr. Kenneth Saka, MD, Pediatric Cardiology. I first saw Dr. Zaka years before when he stopped by the chest radiology reading room. Our dungeon consisted of about five or six, six workstations, giant setups of outsized, high-resolution screens that provided the only light. I was a rookie, a first-year resident, dictating into the voice recognition software. I overheard him two stations down, joking with one of my supervising physicians. A couple of young doctors or medical students stood behind him. He needed to see an MRI study on a toddler with coarctation of the aorta. I remember noticing his voice right away, deep, but without aggression, deliberate and slow, intelligent, as though each phrase had been thought out, warm, but with an undercurrent of humor or wit, as though the very next thing might be a joke, but a joke at no one's expense. I paused my dictation to glance over. I had never seen him before, but even by the ghostly light of the monitors, he looked more than just friendly. He looked familiar. Sitting in his office years later, as the parent of his patient, I would wonder if I had experienced deja vu in reverse that afternoon, if I had recognized him prospectively as someone who would become important to me later. 
To force a rational analysis here, I think his face linked up with a face from my past. His nose, mouth, and chin match uncannily those of Nick Farr, my best friend from elementary school. And of course, it's possible I really had seen Dr. Zaka before, maybe in the hospital cafeteria. Whatever the reason, I liked him three years before I met him. I even recall thinking how that man was born to be a pediatrician, how a kid wouldn't feel scared at all to go see someone like that. I thought about his specialty too, complicated as hell and the hours were probably terrible. I wouldn't get any writing done, I thought, if I'd become a pediatric cardiologist. And so I returned to my job, which consisted of saying sentences rapidly and clearly into a handheld microphone, which heard and transcribed my diagnoses as coldly as I delivered them, right upper lobe pneumonia, left lower lobe mass. And um, the, uh, and you know, he's one of, obviously Dr. Zaka is one of the recurring characters in this book um, and uh, always in a, in, in a, a crucial, crucial role. And I think that when patients review their doctors, they, they say things like, oh, he has a wonderful bedside manner. Oh, he really knows his stuff. And those are kind of like the ways in which, you know, patient reviews of doctors generally uh, form. But this book, I think, is, will show you the, the nitty gritty of how a, a truly brilliant and warm physician can um, not only guide the, the, the treatment course for a patient, but also um, really help a family go through that process. Um, and that's, that's what, a, you know, how in, in a book or a memoir, you get, you get the anecdotes, the emotions and the details, which, you know, it would translate into a patient review in, in very general terms. But I would say all of those things in those terms if I was writing that. But instead, this this book is kind of like um, a glowing uh, five hundred star uh, review of of this of this extraordinary doctor. Um, I'm going to conclude the reading uh, as we finish up here um, with uh, one of the fine the, the final poem in the book because. Um, it's also, uh, it also relates to, uh, it relates to so much. It relates to, above all, to the sense of humility that I have um, when I think about, you know, my own, my own son, who's just this teenager, this little kid, the earlier little kid. Um, and the word that this poem is, is centered around is the word namaste. And the uh, the poem was directly inspired by a, a, a moment in the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, which I had translated. Um, there's a point where Arjuna sees the universal form of the divine. And at that point, he's sort of is surrounded and enveloped by this universal vision of the divine. And he he says, um, I bow to you in, in a thousand directions. Um, I bow to you. And in the same way, uh, this poem um, is about bowing to um, someone who I am the father of, yet who has taught me so much about how to handle adversity. And, um, and so I'll just, I'll just read this. Um, it's in the it's in the uh the final chapter called appropriately enough i bow to you namaste to the conch shell the ocean's house the soldier's horn namaste to the twins of rama in my twins reborn namaste to the symmetry namaste to the snarl the sneeze and the hurricane canceling out Swirl with counter swirl. Namaste to leads on the newborn's chest, to the off blue toes we kissed. Namaste to gallons of blood bank blood and to the Yosemite mist. Namaste sleep 
that slipped the leash. Namaste to the dream. Namaste Odysseus sailing home on a ship of breath and heme. Namaste myth and isthmus. Namaste to the wind. Namaste to covalent bonds that cross link twin and twin. All I can offer is effort. Namaste is all I can do. I bow to the east and I bow to the west. I bow to the God in you. Thank you. Wonderful, Amit. Uh, just very moving and 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 true. Um, it's so great to hear you read, to see these words come to life in your voice. Um, there's nothing that can replace that. Well, we've got some questions and <clears throat> also some well wishes. Uh, let me just start by saying uh, I noticed that uh, if I'm not mistaken, you would shift from poetry, prose into poetry in the reading today, correct me if I'm wrong, but you didn't tell us when you were doing that. Is that true? Did I get that right? Yeah, at one point in the in the first chapter, I did, I did switch in between the two. Um, and I just kind of, it, in the book itself, there's no indication that this is a poem, here you go. So uh, except at some uh, except at some points there are, there are where I talk about the poem before, it, before the poem is is there, but I think in the first chapter it just kind of flows one you know the prose flows into the poetry and vice versa. So how did the the challenge of finding the literary form of the book work for you? I mean, you started with a letter. And it grew into this multifarious approach, narrative prose, poetry, fable. What was the, what, how, was it important to you that, that the struggle to find the form was part of the, the whole process of processing the actual human experience you were going through? Um, yeah, I, I think that the reason that this book took so much longer than anything I've ever written. So this book cumulatively basically took 10 years to write. And I've written longer novels in, for example, my first novel, Partitions, I wrote that in two months and 10 days. So when I get going, I really get going. And there's, I mean, there's a reason why I literally, I, I mean, I have, I've published so many poems over the years and um, I just, you know, and I've published a whole bunch of novels, retold the Mahabharata, which is the world's longest epic in three books. That took less time. The Mahabharata, the entire Mahabharata, retold in three volumes, took less time than Twin A, which is just a couple hundred pages. And I think it's because the experience itself was not, quote unquote, digested. Um, and in many ways, the story was still being told and lived as I was trying to tell it. And so the book could not simply be conceived of and executed the way that I could conceive and execute a book about the 1947 partition of India, or the way I could conceive and execute a retelling of the Mahabharata. The, the, the book itself was incomplete. And so then, now then the question becomes, well, what about the form? So every time I would approach the material, I would try a different way of writing it in a way that that captured the emotion and the and the and the bare bones of the story and this and that. And it was failure after failure after failure from a literary standpoint, from a creative standpoint. So then I have all these different pieces and parts, and there's a whole separate file of stuff that didn't make the cut, quote unquote to get into this book. Um, and the final, when I, when I finally felt that it could be turned into a book, really what I was doing was taking all of these different attempts at telling the story and then arranging them in, an, in, a, in, a, in a way that made an artistic whole and made a readable whole. Um, and so there were times where, okay, now this is where the emotion is best expressed in a poem. Okay, this is where I need to 
put this particular reflection on the experience, this philosophical or con contemplative prose passage of almost expository prose, this has to go here. Okay, this scientific or medical discussion has to go here. And, and that is how the book came about. So really the book in a sense is, is like a coral reef. Um, it has grown by accretion over time into what it is here. But before publication, you actually accepted an earlier version of it, right? You accepted an earlier version of it. And you said, you know, you have these poems and fables at the back. Do you want to incorporate them? And I was like, you know, I kind of do. And I originally did intend to. And so then I, I created a more structured form. And so now if you look at the table of contents, it has an almost a seemingly like uh, programmatic, clearly structured. Each section is like nine um, subsections, you know, all of that was something that I did afterwards, structuring it into something that looks kind of cohesive and predetermined, when in reality, it was it, it was just uh, um, written over 10 years. Um, catch as catch can. Yeah, fantastic. Wonderful answer. Thank you. Well, let me go straight to these other um, questions and comments, because uh, we now have a bunch of them. So I'll just start in, in order that they were received. The first one says, at the end of chapter one, you seem to hint at the idea that experience, or perhaps the experience of suffering, gives one wisdom superior to anything a teacher of wisdom might impart. I wonder if you could say more about that idea. What does experience or suffering confer that is lacking in the wisdom of teachers? You know, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think that for me, um, you know, to there, it's kind of like if you, you, you read about something or you live something and inevitably I feel lived experience is going to be deeper and more immediate than anything you could read in a book, no matter how well written that book is. And it's, it's more a shortcoming of language rather than, and literature, rather than the teacher himself or herself. I feel that um, someone teaching you about suffering or how to, how to handle suffering is, can only take you so far. And that may have to do with my own personal shortcomings where I feel like I personally have read a ton of books of philosophy and religion and this and that and the other. But when I personally am faced with adversity, I'm prone to anxiety. I'm prone to overthinking things. I, 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 I can, you know, not, I may not handle it with as much grace and, and tact as I would love to, to otherwise handle it. And that's because reading is not really a substitute for, experience unfortunately i mean what if only it were but it, i don't think it is so i think that's what it is i think i think that's um i think that has to just do with language rather than 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 teachers themselves fair enough well here's a question that uh you know you can feel free to decline if you want but it's a natural one um so we have the question what does shiv think of the book Oh yeah, you know, I was I had written it originally, started writing it 10 years ago. A few years later, I it had kind of turned into a book. Um, but at that point, Shiv was too young to actually read it. But before this book, um, before the, this book was published, I was able to show a couple of versions to him. And he read them both. And he's he is himself is an extremely precocious reader, an extremely precocious writer. And uh uh I he's actually he actually had his first short story published in a print literary journal at the age of 13. And I've read his work at this age, and he's actually more advanced literarily and emotionally and in every way as a writer than I was at that age. So yeah, I, I am very, very uh, eager to see how he develops over the years and how he develops his art over the years. And I, and I don't just say that as the dad who's really proud of his kid. I actually say objectively because I have I have dot matrix printouts of the things that I wrote when I was his age, 
and he's way better than me. And this is not a joke, but he's really, really way better than me. Um, but yeah, he's read it and he, uh, he, uh, he approved it. He green lighted the, uh, the book. So, and he's actually a contributor to it as well. So when he was 11, he wrote something in English class, which is just pretty amazing, um, which I'll leave all of you to read, but, uh, like this, these two pages are, are actually his contribution to the book. So. Here's one that's, uh, was your artistic sensibility constrained or expanded by the very personal nature of this work or neither? You know, I think that the very personal nature of the, of the, of the subject matter, um, I feel like I attained things in this book that I haven't attained in any of my other books. So in that sense, my, you know, my artistry has been expanded. Um, however, creatively, from a compositional standpoint, I did very much feel um, like it wasn't flowing the way all these other books just kind of flow out of me. Um, it was just way more difficult to write. So it was very humbling to write um, because usually, whether it's prose or verse, I mean, I, I, I've, I've done, I put in so much practice over the years that stuff comes easily. Publishable, writing publishable stuff comes easily to me. Um, and it's, 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 it's because I put in, you know, years and years of work that allows that. But uh, in this case, it didn't come easily to me. And, and even the structure of the book was kind of like uh, very difficult to arrive at. So it's kind of like a both and answer to that question. <laughs> Uh, my favorite kind. Here's one that's, uh, are the poems prose poems then? I believe there were rhymed couplets at the end, though. So that's a very perceptive question from someone right, who's just listening right. so, to it. So, so um, the, uh, the poetry uh, is uh, of various uh, forms. Um, so there is one prose poem in there. There are free verse poems. There's sonnets in there. There's rhyme quatrains. Um, and that kind of reflects the way that I write poetry in general, which is uh, I write in a variety of forms. I don't have a single 10, like a lot of people will just write in free verse or they'll just write in formal poetry. Um, I, I kind of play the field and I, and I try different things. And um, over the many years that I wrote this book you know at various points i would try different verse forms and different um line lengths different rhyme schemes to try and get a hold of you know try to get a hold of this material in in some poetic form or another and so there's a variety of forms of poetry in here beautiful um a number of the chat uh contributions are just beautiful testimonies and tributes and well wishes um, one of those well wishes uh, actually does contain a question within it. The um, individual is curious about how to get the map and the scissors in the U.S. Oh, um, maybe if someone you know is visiting uh, India, you can ask them to pick up a copy. Um, otherwise, you can get them from secondhand sellers in uh, on Amazon, I think. Although I don't know. I, I hope they wouldn't overcharge you for that. So. Um, at some point, uh, hopefully, I will uh, I will have some breakthrough book and that will make publishers want to publish my Indian backlist because I actually have like a ton. I think some of my best work has actually been published in India because uh, Map and the Scissors is a perfect example. And then the first volume of my Mahabharat retelling, um, those are like two of my best best books that I've that I've written. But um, hard to find. I, I, we haven't actually necessarily sent them out to a lot of publishers in America, but just one or two places we sent them, they, they were, they passed on them. So at some point I'm going to aggressively send those books out to try and get American publishers for them. So hopefully eventually you will be able to read it here. But uh, right now it's a, it's a bit difficult. It is getting turned into a movie though, potentially. So maybe you'll be able to watch the movie. So. Wow. Will there be any musical element or. <laughs> no, this is gonna. It seems like he's probably gonna do it more as like a, as a historic, you know, just kind of like a maybe like more of like a gritty kind of historical movie type of thing. No, it'll be more because that's it's a very political novel and it's very um, 
kind of intense. So wouldn't with the Bollywood dance scene, dance numbers would be completely out of place. <laughs> Oh, we have a late breaking uh, question. I think it's a question. Um, I enjoy following you on Twitter, now X, where it often sounds like you're thinking out loud as you make way, your way through various texts. Is that the case? And can you comment on your use of social media as a writer or comment on its usefulness for writers generally? Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, you know, I... um. I'm very wary of social media um, because uh, I feel that it's, you know, basically uh, uh, it's it has a very, very, in, you know, huge down, downside risk, which is that you accidentally think through something out loud that people can't handle. And then you get canceled and you lose your book contracts and you are cast into outer darkness because the literary world is very, very, you know, it's kind of very it has a certain amount of internal thought policing that takes place. And you have to be aware of that. And if you're not aware of that, um, <laughs> you say, don't go on social media. So so be aware of what you can't say and can't think out loud. Uh, but if, you, if you're aware of that and you do that and you, and you stay within the boundaries, it can be a very, very wonderful experience where you can connect with all sorts of people who have the same interests as you. Literally just yesterday, I got a package in the mail it's from a, a poet who loves mythology and writes these huge epic poems. And he sent me this, this, his epic poem that he published. They kind of, and, and it's, and it's, it's cause he felt kind of like he, he vibed with my love of ancient epics, you know? And so, and that was all through Twitter. Um, and you can, you can, um, or X as they now call it. So I think that, uh, Social media is an excellent way to connect with like-minded people for a writer. I think it's an excellent way to, to at least have those people. I mean, everyone wants their post of their poem to go viral. That generally doesn't happen. But people who do love your work and who are very interested in your work, they can then have access to it. They can see what you're doing and what you've recently published. And, and that you can get your word out to those, you know, staunch, uh, you know, uh, supporters to to that you know you have a book coming out or you have you know work coming out um and then uh i also think that social media is actually very very enriching from the perspective of book recommendations you can find excellent book recommendations from all sorts of people because a lot of people are posting books or excerpts from books that they're reading and you can you can see that and if you like an excerpt and a lot of times I've read an excerpt from a book that someone else has posted and be like, you know, I want to get a hold of that. I want to read that. And it's it's it has the same serendipity as what I used to do when I was younger, which is walk down the stacks in in a, a library and just kind of look at the spines and see what called to me. And I would just pick it up and read it. And that was a serendipity bookstores, browsing a bookstore serendipity. Um, and then, you know, now brick and mortar bookstores are rare, you, you know, even, you know, you, you're not necessarily going to find your way to a library necessarily, but from the comfort of your own home on your phone or on your, on your uh, computer, you can just have that serendipitous finding of books to read, which can send you into fruitful directions that you wouldn't have even thought, you know, a day earlier. Um, so I, I actually love social media, to be honest with you. I think it's wonderful, but I think it's wonderful because of how it nourishes and and, ex and expands my literary life. Wow, that turned out to be a really cool answer. Thank you. I'm, I uh, I must admit, I, as a publisher, I got a kick out of watching, you know, you and like Jonathan Gellner, another one of our slant authors, going back and forth, you know. Um, I, I, I would love to meet him, actually, because uh, I feel like if we ever got in the same room, uh, we would we would just uh, go on forever uh, talking about all sorts of things because he's a very interesting guy. Oh, hey, he's he's just in Michigan. So, you know, You're right? You're you guys can right. meet halfway. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was amazing and beautiful and moving. We're so excited for you to have this book out and uh, so happy that you could be joined here today by some of your literary admirers, but also friends and family to make it uh, just a beautiful moment. 
uh, for launching this book into the world. Just to conclude, Twin A is available for purchase in cloth bound, paperback, and ebook editions through all the major online retailers. If you go to the book's webpage at slantbooks.org, you can find links to several of those outlets, including bookshop.org. See the link in the chat box. Now, a heads up you are all going to have to brace yourselves because Slant will be bringing out about a book a month for the foreseeable future. So we don't want you to fall behind. The best way to keep up is to visit our website and sign up for Slantwise, our occasional e-newsletter. I was going to say monthly, but let's just say occasional (laughs) as things are turning out. Just go right to the bottom of any web page and you'll find where you can subscribe to Slantwise. You can also follow us on social media. Next month, we will publish Old Songs by Olga Sedekova one of Russia's leading poets, an outspoken critic of Russian aggression in Ukraine, and often mentioned as a possible future Nobel laureate in literature. We're going to be recording a conversation between Ms. Sedakova and Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, to launch her collection. That will be done uh, offline, just to make sure that we can handle the various time zones and technical challenges of that, but that will then be edited and posted as a podcast and YouTube video. So we hope you will look out for that. Sedekova is an invaluable voice, one too little known in the West. Tonight's event has been recorded and will soon be available on the Slant book page, on our YouTube channel, and of course, through Slantcast. You can now subscribe to Slantcast through all the major podcast outlets, including Spotify, Apple, Audible, and many others. Finally, please remember that none of this would be possible without your tax-deductible donations. You ensure that books like Twin A, books that do slip between the cracks of the marketing you know, conglomerates of our world, that they can be published and reach a world of readers hungry for literary craft and enduring themes, books that do research into the human. To support our work, just go to slantbooks.org and click on Donate. Finally, remember to tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Thanks again, and see you next time.